On May 15, 2012, the world was first introduced to Diablo 3, a larger-than-life adventure game where players hack and slash their way through hordes of monsters and demons to defeat the ultimate primeval, Diablo. As one of the most divisive games in Blizzard's history comes to the end of its lifespan, we think it's time to look back at Diablo 3's rocky start, how it created one of the most controversial marketplaces in gaming history, and just how easily the road to hell can be paved with good intentions. This is the history of Diablo 3's Real Money Auction House. If you were to ask anyone who was a PC gamer in the early 2000s for a list of the most influential games of the time, somewhere near the top, you would be sure to see Diablo 2. As one of the most beloved PC games of all time, Diablo 2 is one act that no one wants to follow. So when it finally came time for the development of a sequel, the team involved had a colossal task in front of them. How do you recapture the magic of this 90s hit while bringing innovation, modern gameplay, and fresh new aesthetics? Well, you start by fixing the problems and inconveniences that Diablo players had been living with for the better part of a decade. While Diablo 2 was, and is, still highly praised, it came with a couple glaring problems. The first is its graphics. Even for its time, Diablo 2's visuals were dated and only a marginal upgrade from its predecessor. To address this, Diablo 3 attempted to include a wide range of colors and particle effects to create the most visually pleasing and stimulating aesthetics possible. As Blizzard would come to find out, however, this overly colorful and WoW-esque look was not at all what fans of the franchise were looking for. With thousands of fans signing petitions before the game's release to see the color downscaled to a more dark and gothic look. The second major change was made to the skill system. Instead of the more rigid D2 system, where skill points were locked into a tree, D3 attempted to have a more flexible and free-flowing system, where skills could be changed at any time in the menu, encouraging customization. This allowed players to find the playstyle and ability combinations that worked for them, without having to commit to a build. This change was received a lot more favorably than the first, with many reviewers citing it as one of the strongest choices Blizzard made with the game. However, this paled in comparison to Diablo 3's most impactful change, the in-game auction house. When gearing up for Diablo 3, the dev team wanted to address the glaring issue of third-party trading that had ruined the experience for many players in Diablo 2. It was apparent to the team that any time open and unrestricted trading between players is an option, there would be an inherent risk of third parties scamming their player base. The Diablo team wanted to avoid what they could after watching similar activity in Diablo 2 and World of Warcraft. The question became how best to go about it. According to former Diablo 3 game director, Jay Wilson, in a 27 interview, quote, the two best ways to stop it are, one, don't have trading, or heavily regulate it. I think this is actually a good choice for a lot of games. When you weigh the downsides of scamming, botting, spamming, etc. on your player base versus depriving the subset that like to trade from doing it, I think it falls in favor of no trading for a lot of games. Option 2. Build trading into the economy such that your player base won't be tempted to third-party groups to trade. The auction house came out of the desire to legitimize third-party trading so that players would stay in the game to do their trading, rather than go to third-party sites, and as a result, reduce fraud. The problem is, of course, it over-legitimized trading. The team's solution was to implement an auction house inspired by those that had worked in World of Warcraft, the difference being that players could utilize both in-game currency as well as real-world money. This system was seen as a way to minimize the risks to players, as well as provide a safe and open place to keep the Diablo trading community alive and thriving. It was sound enough in theory, but as we all know, no plan survives contact with the enemy, and once Diablo 3 launched, the flaws in the system became crystal clear. 
The initial launch of Diablo 3 ended up being a bit of a mixed bag, as most reviewers seemed to have been treated to a seamless experience prior to release. But when players finally got their hands on the game, it was a bit of a different story. To this day, there is a massive discrepancy between critical and audience reception, with the success of the game's historic release being undercut with service issues providing less than ideal gaming conditions. While the title released with 6.3 million sales in the first week, the game was also plagued with server issues, controversy, and backlash. While some issues, like the now infamous Error 37, were solved within a week of launch, after some heated responses, I can barely stand up and fucking shit like I can't even play the fucking game! Others managed to plague the game for longer. Diablo 3's Real Money Auction House went live in June of 2012, almost a month after the launch of the base game, and almost immediately it started making waves. While Blizzard's intended end goal of reducing fraud and illegal transactions was a success, within the first two months of Diablo's release, it became apparent to designers that there was a problem with the auction house. Players complained in droves about how use of the auction house felt necessary at certain levels, and that as a result, the game felt very pay to win. Although not everyone shared this sentiment. Matter of fact is that it's not a pay to win game, because as you see, when you get the best gear possible, um, you really don't win anything. Uh, all you can really do is uh, farm more gear more effectively. So uh, if you already have the best gear, you effectively don't win. There's, there's no win part. So Diablo 3 is actually um, not a pay to win game. It, it's uh, a pay to not win game. Regardless, a majority of the player base was unhappy. The problems stemmed from two key areas. First, there was the convenience factor. Due to the low probability of finding high level gear for your class, and because there was no readily available option to buy your way into the highest level gear, there was virtually no incentive to commit to the grind of trying to earn your own equipment. While this focus on convenience certainly hurt player experience, it didn't elicit as much of a public outcry as the auction house's second key problem, its necessity at high levels. As with Diablo 2, D3 offered multiple levels of difficulty so that players could tackle harder and harder challenges as they played and replayed the main campaign. However, with Diablo 3, Blizzard decided to include an extra challenge, Inferno Mode. Inferno Mode was designed for players who had capped out their levels and gear, effectively making the game like a high-end raid in World of Warcraft. The problem with this was the gear requirements. Due to Inferno Mode's insane level of challenge, it was effectively impossible to complete unless you had the best gear in the game. But the catch is that you could only attain the best gear in the game by playing Inferno Mode. This put players into a predicament with only one readily available solution. Use the Auction House. This level of necessity led many players to accuse Blizzard of perpetuating a money grab and making the game pay to win. Now, the cries of the players did not fall on deaf ears. However, the dev team was restricted in their capacity to make sweeping changes to the game, and were only allowed to make tweaks for the first two months of the game's release. And while these changes were small, they did what they could to alleviate some of the burdens placed on the player. For example, in patch 1.0.3, released one month after launch, players were no longer restricted to finding the highest level items in Acts 3 and 4 of Inferno Mode. Instead, all Inferno Acts would drop high level gear, as well as Act 3 and 4 of Hell Mode. While this didn't completely remove dependence on the Auction House, it at least gave players a moderately difficult area that they could grind for loot. Within this first month window, it had become apparent to many members of the Diablo team that the Auction House may have been a mistake. At the very least, it was having an adverse effect on player experience due to its interaction with other systems in the game. In reference to this, Wilson stated, quote, It was clear right away that it was doing harm to the game, but we weren't sure right away what to do about it. Within a month or two, I know I wished we hadn't done it, but I wasn't sure it had to be shut down. Then he goes on to say, It's harder to make the call when you can see how much your players are using the system. It was extremely popular among players, if you gauge by usage, which can make decisions like that difficult to make. End quote. While the dev team would continue to work on the problem, no one wanted to make sweeping changes to essential game systems until there was a readily available solution to replace it. In the meantime, the auction house would stay, 
giving rise to a group of players exploiting the system for their own gains. In the year after the release of the Real Money Auction House, many players had found loopholes or workarounds in order to abuse the Real Money system to turn large profits. For example, during the launch of Patch 1.0.8, there was a temporary bug which allowed players to duplicate gold. Some of the most successful at this were able to make literal hundreds of trillions of gold, which could then be turned around and sold for a profit. This dramatic inflation to the economy necessitated a response from Blizzard, who quickly lowered the price floor on gold to a tenth of what it had been. While this was hardly the only incident of abuse on the marketplace, all it ultimately did was reinforce what was already known by the team. The auction house had to go. However, even with all of its issues, Blizzard couldn't simply remove it without upsetting the game economy and invalidating a lot of money that players had invested into the game. In order to combat this, the dev team focused their efforts into finding a long-term solution which could be implemented during the release of Diablo's soon-to-be-released expansion, Reaper of Souls. One of the biggest hurdles to removing the auction house was needing to redesign the loot drop system. Since the current loot system often dropped useless items for the character pulling them, the removal of the auction house necessitated a change at the most fundamental level of the loot system. Without the ability to trade and sell their unwanted items, players needed some kind of guarantee that they would still be able to attain the gear that they needed. The newly designed system lovingly referred to as Loot 2.0 featured a smart loot system. As of Patch 201 and moving forward into Reaper of Souls, Every time an item drops, including legendary and set items, it now has a chance to be what we call a smart drop. A smart drop is an item that takes your current class into consideration when rolling its stats. As a result, players should now find more items that are relevant and useful to the hero they're playing. To balance this, Blizzard also increased the average stats on items found, while lowering item drop rates to reflect the more personalized nature of loot. However, the biggest and most controversial change to the system came in the form of account locking all legendary items to the individual who found it first. Not only did this prevent items from being sold on a marketplace, it also restricted trades between friends. The only way to transfer the highest level items required being present when the item dropped for the first time. With these new changes in place, it was finally time to announce to the public that change was on the way. On September 17th, 2013, Blizzard made an announcement regarding the closure of the auction house. Quote, When we initially designed and implemented the auction house, the driving goal was to provide a convenient and secure system for trades. But as we've mentioned on different occasions, it became increasingly clear that despite the benefits of the AH system, and the fact that many players around the world use it, it ultimately undermines Diablo's core gameplay, kill monsters to get cool loot. With that in mind, we want to let everyone know that we've decided to remove the gold and real money auction house system from Diablo 3. In a follow-up video, Diablo 3's production director and new game director elaborated on the reasoning behind the auction house closure. At the core of the Diablo experience is a promise of killing monsters, killing demons, for, for the promise of finding those epic items. And the auction house just made the, that experience way too convenient and really short-circuited our core reward loop. The video went on to announce that the auction house would be closing six months later on March 18th, 2014, just short of two years after launch. Fans were shocked by the announcement that the auction house would be shutting down. For two years, the auction house had been the principal means for acquiring the gear necessary for high-level endgame gameplay. And while the auction house may not have been perfect, the thought of trading it for some unknown system seemed dodgy at best. Many players feared that closing the auction house may refocus the gameplay to where it should have been, but at the price of killing any feeling of community that the game had left. Other players felt robbed, with many complaining about the incoming loss of revenue that they would experience. While closing the auction house was met with trepidation by the existing player base, the launch of the Reaper of Souls expansion was expected to bring back new and former players alike, who would be coming back into a much more manicured experience. Upon the launch of Reaper of Souls and the subsequent shutdown of the auction house, the expansion was met with generally positive reviews by critics and players alike. Many praised the changes to the loot system and the overall improvement with the gameplay brought on by Loot 2.0. 
While some fans still seem pretty sour over the loss of the AH and their income, the majority of players seem to like the changes, with the Metacritic user score being a full 50% higher than the base game. Diablo 3 would continue to see further improvement and optimization in its various console ports, agreed by many to be the highest quality versions of the game. As intended, with the removal of the auction house, Diablo 3 became a much cleaner and more streamlined experience. However, as many fans suspected it would, the lack of trading changed the very foundation of the Diablo community. The new system had the unforeseen consequence of making the game feel much more like a streamlined single player game, rather than a communal dungeon crawl where everyone was in it together. Of the two options, the 2.0 patch was definitely the lesser of two prime evils. But even with all the continued support and quality of life patches received since Reaper of Souls launch, Diablo 3 never quite reached the heights that fans and developers had expected. Now, with Diablo 4 just around the corner, Blizzard once again has the opportunity to recapture the magic of PC gaming's golden age. But in order to do so, they have to be mindful of the lessons of the past. Since Diablo 3, we have seen the launch and subsequent success of several games with a similar formula. Torchlight, Grim Dawn, and more recently, Path of Exile, all stand on their own as successes, with each title bringing things to the table which Blizzard could learn from. Bringing Diablo back to its former glory may be difficult, but in the words of the great Deckard Cain, We have come too far to be defeated now, my friend. I have seen you complete many difficult quests. Though this may be your greatest trial, it is not beyond your reach.